Father, there are so many things that change around us these days. It seems like every hour, Lord, we get new news, uh, new changes in our schedules, God, and we know, and we are so thankful that your word never changes, that your promises are true when they were written as they are today. So God, dwell in our hearts now for this brief time that we open your word and captivate our minds and our hearts once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you've been with us for five weeks or you're just starting, you're at the tail end of a sermon series called Boundaries. And we were talking about boundaries in relationships with our time, with, with people. Today, we're going to talk about boundaries at work. And why is this important? Because of this, is if you don't establish healthy boundaries in work or any other part of your life, you will have resentments that will build up either resentments that you have with other people because they're crossing a boundary that you didn't verbalize or something. We all have them, we just don't verbalize them. Or people are expecting things from you and you're not producing, you're not doing that. And all sorts of chaos, just bad things happen. Boundaries are needed in so many ways. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to look, believe it or not, the Bible has a lot to say about boundaries and work. In fact, at the eight o'clock service, I couldn't speak enough about all the different parts of the Bible. I didn't even have in here. I was bringing this one in. I'm going to try to keep more focused and streamlined for you so I'm not all over the place. But having said that, the first half of the message, we're going to be in a lot of different parts of scripture. The second half, we're going to have a very practical application from Exodus chapter 18. So if you want to kind of put your thumb there, your finger in Exodus 18 and find that, that's what we're going to be going through. And another word of advice here when it comes to work. Some of you might have seen this topic and thought, well, you know what? I'm not working at a job and getting paid right now, so it doesn't apply to me. Guess what? It does apply to you. In fact, God has given us work to do our entire life. If you are a young adult or you're uh, you know, just starting to walk, you name it, there's always work that God has in front of you to do. It just is a question of what does that work look like? I can't tell you how many people in my ministry have come to me. They're so excited. Pastor, I'm retiring. Yay. Four months later, they're like, Pastor, I'm busier now than I was when I was working. I wish I could go back to work. The thing is, we all have work to do. And here's a little spoiler. When you look close at the Bible, my understanding is that God actually is going to have work for us to do in heaven. Like, no, I thought I'd sit around with a harp with a chubby butt and sit on the cloud, but that's not what God has planned for us. There's work for us, and I know it's going to be good and cool, you name it. Now, I want you to think back to your childhood so you can really kind of get into this thinking of work. I I would suggest that most of us have our work ethic carved out for us from our parents. When we are young, we will see how our parents work. And you are probably at one end of the spectrum or maybe in the middle, but there's one area where you see your parents and they have like full-time jobs. They're both working really hard. They'll pass you off to whoever will watch you. And you're like, that's really crazy. They're work, work, work. Or you could have been grown up on the other side where you have parents that could maybe have been alcoholics or they had trouble keeping a job down because of their personality, you name it. And they're like from one job to another. Sometimes there's six months, they're not working, right? Both of those extremes are not good. They're not the healthy work boundary life that God has intended for you. And so we want to find a place in the middle where we say, God, we want to continue to live our lives and do work, whatever that looks like, in a way that you've designed what is best for us and put those boundaries up that help. When I was a kid, my mom and dad were blue-collar workers. My dad worked at a printing company, and quite often he would get called in right when he got home, half-hour drive, he gets home, they're like, hey, Perk, we need you back to run the press again. So he'd go in for another eight hours. Where my mom, she was a a, a checker at Kroger's, and she would be working that night as well. So my grandpa would take care of me, and he would take me to the bar, and I'd get an eight-ounce thing of Coke and fall asleep on the pool table. My mom didn't know this until a couple years ago. She's like, he did what? I'm like, it was great. I loved it. I'm like, you guys, go work all you want. I'm with Grandpa having fun. Then when I got older, I thought, I, I got this figured out. When I'm 20 years old, I don't have to go to college. When I'm 20 years old, I will be the third baseman for the St. Louis Cardinals. 
Terry Pendleton will be retiring then. I will be the Cardinals' third baseman. I will play with them for 15 years, retire when I'm 35, and have all the money I ever need. Well, when I was 14 and got on the freshman, I realized I'm no baseball player. These guys were good. And you know what? I love my job. I love being a pastor. I love being your pastor here at St. John. But we all, even if we love our job, we have to have boundaries. Because this could be a nonstop, never-ending job. And some of you know exactly what I'm talking about in your vocation as well. So what does the Bible say about this? How can we start asking questions of ourselves personally and look at what God has to say, finish with Jesus and say, okay, this is what God has for me right now. So open up your scripture. You're going to ask the first question to kind of get you into this is, how much is enough? Right? You work probably to make money, and so you think, how much is enough? And you might look in your safe these days, and you're like, well, I have all this cash, or maybe it's actually in gold, and you think, well, uh, maybe just a little bit more, right? Maybe just a little bit more. I mean, that's a, a logical way to think. A lot of times we'll look and we'll try to figure out, well, I don't know how long I'm going to live, so maybe I just need to take that job where uh, they're going to promise me double salary. Yeah, I'll be traveling a little bit more, and my family won't mind. And then you realize a year into it, you're like, oh my goodness, how much is enough, right? I've just sacrificed. Boundaries were not there. Or you could just go full-blown, full who needs how much is enough, and go basically to greed, right? You're like, ah, I'm just going to swim in this stuff. I can't wait to see how much I get. And you know, I'm I might live to be 120, so I got to make sure I have enough retirement. And you, 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 can, you can rationalize this until the, the, the cows come home. You can rationalize in your head, I have to work, 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 work. Or you could be on the other end and you could be a sloth, a sluggard. You can be a person who's like, you know what? Uh, I'm going to find out whose couch can I be on next. Y'all have family members like this, right? Well, I'm just going to stay with you uh, about a month and it turns into a year and a month. And they're like, well, why do I need to work? I'm getting $2,400 a month, right? It's going to cost me to go to work. I mean, we have a lot of issues in our society right now, but one of them that shouldn't be for you is that God called you to work. In fact, he has so designed you to work that if you fall on this end of the spectrum and your boundaries are out the window, you're like, I'm just going to be lazy, you will actually face spiritual depression. I've seen it happen over and over especially to, to, to people that may be a little older and are like, man, I'm retired, I got this money, I have to do anything. If you spend months and years doing nothing, you will miss God's purpose. There's a reason he has you still breathing, remember? And he, God designed us to have purpose. And I don't care what age you are, God designed you to do something. If God cancels school until January, say, yay! No, you need the social part of it, guys. If God cancels school to January, you better find yourself something to do because you will get very sad. God designed you to be doing something. Where are the boundaries? Proverbs chapter 24, I don't have it printed for you, but Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30 says this. I went past a field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. So what's God say? If you're not doing anything, you got no sense. This doesn't make any sense. God designed you to be doing something. And so the next question logically would be, why do you work anyway? Have you ever thought about that? How many of us actually grow up, we're like, okay, I'm supposed to go to school, do this, go to high school, college, and now I'm supposed to get a job. And then you find yourself 35, 45, 55, 65, and you never ask, well, why am I doing this anyway? Is it just because you're supposed to? Is it just because, well, I got to provide good money, that's it, I'm going to do it, I'm, I want to get super rich? or because there's nothing else to do. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you work? You could have all sorts of answers, but the Bible, I think, clearly has two that keep coming up as I was researching this. There are two answers that God would have why you work, and the first one is for God. I work for God. And part of the scripture that, that encourages us to think this way, like you're working for God, it, there's two verses. The first one is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And this is a verse that sometimes gets overlooked because we love verses 8 through 9. Verses 8 through 9 are those that say, hey, we're saved by grace through faith. This is not a work of our own. Nobody can, but this is actually a confirmation verses. If you're online, you're like, what's confirmation? When kiddos get baptized and then they're in eighth grade and they become uh, adults, they confirm, this is what I believe they pick a favorite verse. Verses 8 through 9 are usually one of those. So what's verse 10 say? Listen to this. It has to do with work. 
Paul says, for we, that's you, you are, crea- you are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do what? To sit around on the couch, to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Love this verse. Let me, let me pick it apart for you. Some translations, which I like a little better, they'll say, we are God's masterpiece. That's a good translation of the Greek, is a masterpiece. Now you think of a masterpiece, it is a one of a kind. It is beautiful. It is wonderful. It, it, a lot of detail is put into it, a masterpiece. You are God's one of a kind masterpiece. What? To do good works, which he pre- prepared in advance for you. So here's what it looks like when you're working for God. God may say, I have designed you. I have given you skills. I have put only you with those skills in the circles of relationships that you have and have only given you that knowledge that only you can fulfill this. When you look at 7 billion people in this world, maybe 8, I don't know, when you look at all the people you're competing with for a job, whatever that job is, is, God has you as that masterpiece. He has specifically called you to fulfill that job. And that's a mental boundary where you're going to say, you know what, I'm going for that. Because I think God is leading me there. That's a good boundary to say, I am doing this for God because he has designed it. And then if you look in Colossians chapter 3, it gets even better. And this is the verse that that you're going to, you really have to hold on to here. Colossians 3 says this, whatever you do, whatever you work at, right? Work at it with all your heart as if you're working for the Lord, not for human masters. How many of you need this right now? You have a boss that has no integrity. How many of you need this right now? You have someone that you work with that just rubs you wrong. You can't stand them. How many of you have a job right now you just had to take because it's the only thing you can get right now and you can't stand it? God says, you're working for me. And it's not a mistake that he has you where he does in this chapter in that job right now. And your job could be actually home taking care of a loved one. Your job could be, as a young adult, taking care of the house, doing some things for mom and dad, helping out as a good family member. Whatever that job is, you are working for God and not the other bosses. You love them, you honor them, you respect them. Maybe you don't love them, but you respect them, right? You respect them because God has them in authority there. But you are working for God. And so a great boundary to remember when you're working is that, you know what, I'm doing this for God. Not having to please other people. The second reason that we work, not just for God, we also work for family, for family. Now, this is a pretty harsh verse, but it's there, so we're going to read it. Here it is. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8 says this, anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. What? What? What this is saying is that you work in part to provide for your family or those that God puts around you as family. And if you don't, you're worse than an unbeliever. That's crazy, right? Well, what does he mean by this? It doesn't mean that you're supposed to provide for all 25 of your relatives that live all over the country. Can you send me $500? That is not what that means. What it means is that that we are provide for those who God put in our household, our family, to take care of, but also those in our family that are in need, in real need. In fact, if you want to know God's heart on this, in a lot of parts of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, you will see God's heart coming through when it says, remember the widows and the orphans. Remember the widows and the orphans. In the book of Acts, when there's a dispute on who's getting served and who's doing what, the disciples said, but remember the widows and the orphans. Now, you might not have widows or orphans in your house, but you do have people that fit under the the susceptible guidelines that you need to care for them and take care of them because they can't do that for themselves. I see people doing that all the time, and God bless you because you are doing what this says. You are taking care of a family member who needs you at this chapter of their life. That's why we work. What an amazing boundary. You're like, no, I can't go out and play games tonight. I can't go out and do this because I have to make sure that I'm working so that I can provide for my family right? A continuing continuing thought from that verse is this. God provides work as a means to provide and not to hoard, right? 
It says to provide and not to hoard. How much is enough? Well, just a little bit more? No. In fact, Jesus speaks to this in Luke chapter 12. He gives a parable. He says there was this guy that was making hand over fist. That's my translation. He was making so much money that he started to build barn after barn to put all the stuff he was, his storehouses. And it says, you fool, Jesus says, because that night you have no idea. This night your life is going to be taken from you. And then what's, who's going to get all this stuff? Probably people who don't care. They're going to squander it in about a week. So it's important to remember that God provides or gives you work so that you can provide at that time, not to just hoard it away, right? There's a balance there, a boundary balance that I work to save, but I also work to help people currently. I have fallen into the idea, like when I got married, I realized that I am a saver, 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 right? And my wife is not a spender, 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 but she's like, hey, let's go on vacation. I'm like, no, we got to save money so that when we're 65, we can go on vacation, you know, like, when I, when I was ministering to you before I got married, like, I didn't go anywhere hardly except just a couple places. I'm like, why is this happening? And then I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm married. We're actually going to go do something together. We're creating good memories. We work so that we can provide some good memories, some good times, you name it, right? We don't blow it all, but we have a balance there. So this is all a balance, okay? Remember, as I started the sermon, I said, you followed too far this way, too far that way. That's not what God has in mind. Healthy work life involves establishing boundaries which honor God, family, and self. And this one is probably a, a real close to home to some of us. I'm going to say it again. A healthy work life is one that provides, that, that, that establishes boundaries that honor God, family, and self. How many of us work so much or we're like, you know what, I haven't been to church in six weeks, I just, I got to work again. Uh, I, I really can't spend time reading God's word with God. I, I'm working. Martin Luther, he had a, a solution for this. He would say, the days he is so busy, he's like, I got I to gotta spend twice as much time in prayer. That didn't make any sense to the world. But God is like, no, uh, work does not get in the way. I need my, my time with you, and you need my time with me, your time with me. So, so healthy boundaries in work say, I can't work to the detriment of my relationship with God. I also can't work for the detriment of my relationship with family. How many of you grew up knowing that, you know what, I never saw dad because all he did was work? You don't want that. Now's the time to change. Today's a new day. You can restart and say, no, I'm creating a boundary right now. I am not picking up that phone at dinner. I am gonna, the emails can wait until the morning. I'm going to establish that and let my kids see that. In fact, if this is enticing to you, the next three weeks we got a sermon called Connected 3D. We're actually going to give you practical tips on how to use or not use your devices in a way to actually connect with your family. Okay, so stay tuned for that. And the third one is this, healthy boundaries at work. You honor God, you honor family, and yourself. The world has lied to us that it's selfish to take care of ourself. It is not. If you don't take care of yourself, you're no good to anybody, including when you retire. How many people have you seen, like they work their tail off and they don't care about their body, or their spiritual life, you name it, and by the time they're 65, they retire, like, then I'm going to work out, then I'm going to go on vacation. They die the next year, right? That's not helpful. That's not helpful. So this is God giving you permission, saying it's okay to take care of yourself. It's okay to have some self-time. Now, it doesn't mean we're going to get like a massage every other day and getting our toes and our fingers done every other day, right? I mean, like there's a balance to that as well. Balance, okay. So you're probably wondering, has he ever had his toes done? I'm not telling. Okay. Um, so question Here's where we get to Exodus 18. And before we, we jump into this, I want to set it up for you, okay? Exodus 18. Has anybody out there ever had a relative named Jethro? Okay, I just wondered. So there's a guy named Jethro, and Jethro is the Midian priest who happens to be the father-in-law of Moses, right? Y'all know Moses. Moses was the guy that, that captivates the whole first well, four of the first five books of the uh, Old Testament, okay? Moses is the guy, he's 40 years old, and he kills an Egyptian, and then he flees off to Midian, where he all of a sudden finds this beautiful Zipporah, supposedly he marries her, and her dad is named Jethro. So Moses spends year 41 of his life until year 80 with Jethro, his whole family, his wife. They are uh, being shepherds out in the wilderness, 
And at age 80, Moses is called back. God says, hey, go back to Pharaoh. Go to Egypt. Let my people go. All these plagues happen. You can read about this in Exodus 9, 10, 11, 12, all these, these places, right? So where we find ourselves, he's, it's probably, he's probably 81, 82, something like that. They, they're across the Red Sea. They are camped, it says, at the beginning of this chapter. It says they are camped at the bottom of the mountain of God, which we know as Mount Sinai. This is where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments, the law. So everything's kind of just chill, and Moses calls for his father-in-law to come visit. So he comes, brings the grandchildren, all this kind of stuff, kind of has things established. You know, they all come, and the first day, the Bible tells us, the first day they had a wonderful feast, and they had dinner together. Life was going great. And then day two. Day two happens. Jethro wakes up, he probably gets some coffee, whatever he does, you know, and he looks out and he sees Moses is already at work. And he sees that Moses is not only at work, but there are people lined up like it's the DMV. I mean, they're waiting in line forever as far as I can see. That'll make more sense to you in a minute. And he says, hey, what you're doing is not right. This is, this is, chaos the way you're you're creating this scenario so what's going on he asked moses why are you the only one why are you the sole judge up here and and if this doesn't bring chaos to your minds let me just tell you scholars would tell us that when the israelites left egypt anywhere from one to 1.6 million of them were in the group this is not 2,000 people this is 1 to 1.6 million, lots of people, and, and Moses is the only guy. So here's, here's what Moses' answer is. Uh, before I get there, I'm just going to, you know, the first point is this. Is this God's purpose for me? You've got to ask yourself, is this job God's purpose for me? And here's what Moses answers when, he, when, he, when Jethro says, why are you doing this, right? Like, is this the purpose that God has for you? Chapter 18, verse 15 says this. Moses said to his father-in-law, because the people come to me to inquire of God. This is why. They come to me to inquire. I got to do this. When they have a dispute, it comes to me. And I judge between a man, his neighbor, and make known the statutes of God's law. Right? Now, how many people could this be? There's 1 to 1.6 million. Now, I don't, now, now, probably not all of them went to the court every day. Like, many of you, you don't go to court like every week, right? Some of you do. But anyway, uh, not every week. But there were people stacking up. And I could imagine, like, it's so chaotic and crazy for them that they're probably, like, on Black Friday. I could imagine them taking their tents and thinking, okay, this is where Moses is going to see it today. It's 2 in the morning. We just got done doing whatever we're doing. We had a short little nap. We're going to camp out in front here and be the first in line. We're going to get, actually, bracelets so that we can save our place in line in front of Moses. I mean, this is craziness. And they wait all day long for Moses all by himself. Does this sound like a crazy boundary or lack thereof in work? Are you doing everything? Control freak, I'm just telling you. Okay, so this is what happens. Is this his purpose? Well, yes, right? We don't want to disparage Moses in terms of God gave him the law, and he's supposed to dispense it. He is the judge right now. But what's the problem? So it is his purpose. Just listen. It could be your purpose that you're supposed to be doing this job right now. And many of you are like, yeah, this is, I'm locked in, man. This is how God designed me. This is my job. So the, the one boundary is down. One boundary question is down. You're like, okay, this is my purpose, right? So Moses had that. But the next question is super important as well. Do I have proper balance? Am I balanced in my purpose? in my work life, in what I'm doing. And this is the question all of us will have to wrestle with every year of our lives. In what I am doing, am I balanced in this? Because it's so easy. Just like your car gets out of alignment, out of balance, you can get out of balance so easy. Well, look what, look what Jethro says here. He says, Moses' father-in-law said to him, the thing that you are doing is not good. You'll surely wear out both yourselves and these people who are with you. You can wear people out real quick when they know that all they have to do is wait, 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 wait. I mean, you're going to wear them out. For the task is too heavy for you. You can't do it alone. Listen to me. I'm going to give you some counsel and God be with you. You be the people's representative before God 
you bring the disputes to God, then teach them the statutes, laws, and make them to know the ways that they are to walk and to work with. Okay? So, what is he up to here? Here's the word. Delegation. Delegation. How hard is that? If you're anything like me, you know your craft. You're like, how am I going to delegate that? Because they're not going to do as good a job at it. And this is where his father-in-law says, no, you have to let it go. In fact, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 9 says that we as the workers at the church, we are to equip the saints, that's you, to do the work of ministry. How many churches have you seen? They're stuck at 200. They're stuck at 250 people. They never grow bigger because the pastor, pastors or the staff, they're like, we're going to do it all. We're not going to give up some of the ministry for other people to do. This is the bottleneck that Moses was facing. And Ephesians 4 tells us, no, you're there to equip the people. And I love that about St. John. I love it that we have systems in place where people are able to love on others through small groups, through care ministry, you name it. You're like, hey, if this is my purpose, not just the pastors do this. It's a beautiful thing to see people pray over other people. It's not just the pastors doing this. Yet this is the boundaries that need to be established. Like you are not doing it all yourself. And then the final one is this. How do I create healthy boundaries in general? How do I create healthy boundaries? boundaries? This is a huge question. Like, what does it practically look like in your life? His was pretty simple, right? Um, I'm going to just give you an overview of this. I'm not going to read all of it because of time, but basically he said, hey, divide these up into 50s, 100s, 10s, you name it. And he says, get capable men that are godly men that you trust that can actually take these disputes. And the really hard, challenging ones, Jethro said, Moses, then have them bring those to you and life will get much better. You might have some editing to do in your lifestyle, in your job, and what's going on. Even if you are working in the home, let's say, your work is at home. Maybe you are doing way too much. You're doing the laundry, the dishes, vacuuming, bathrooms. You're mowing the lawn, you do all this stuff. You need help. What does that look like? Or maybe you're sitting there thinking, uh, I'm going to let Moses do it, and I'm just going to chill out at my tent and have a great time and smoke some Hebrew cigars. You know, I'm wondering what these guys were doing. You know, some of them had some intelligence, and they were like, Moses is doing this all by himself. Let him do it. And Jethro's like, no, there are capable men that can help you. And so maybe you have to step up, and you're that one who's like, you know what? I've been kind of relaxing too long. God has designed me to do work. How can I help my family? How can I help my coworkers? Because they're all doing my job, right? We can go to both sides of this, guys. Where are you on the boundaries. I'm going to close it with this. Jesus. You know that guy, Jesus. He came to love on you, to save you, to give you hope, to help you with boundaries. When he came to this world, he had one, one job to do in particular, and it was to save you, to build a bridge back to the Father, your creator. And he did that on the cross. Luke chapter 9 tells us that he, and I love this, he says, he resolutely set his face towards Jerusalem. So in Luke chapter 9, he looked and he's like, that's where I need to go. I know it and I'm going. Yet he had so many people, remember in the Gospels, where he was ministering, he had to try to get away. He's like, I'm just going to go across the river. They are like sprinters. They get, all of a sudden there's a bigger crowd on the other side of the river. They don't let him go. Kind of sounds like your life. You're like, I got all this work. I come home. People, let's just give me a break. Well, Jesus knew there was times that he retreated, right? Self-care. He sometimes spent all night praying with God. And he didn't worry in a way of saying, I have to do it, I have to do it, I have to do it. He did what God's purpose, right, the primary purpose he called him for to do, we talked about. And then you know what he did with the rest of the stuff? He gave it to those 11 guys. You know, Judas, he took off. But the other 11, oh my goodness, you read about these guys? He didn't write anything down that we know of, but he's like, I'm just going to tell these guys for three years and they're going to do it. And you know what? They all scattered on him. Yet Jesus had good boundaries. He knew that God was going to work all this out, and if he continued to do what he needed to do, everything else would fall into place. And look at what those guys did. With the help of the Holy Spirit, now we have almost 2 billion of us living on this planet that confess Jesus is our Lord. Praise God for that. Praise God for his boundaries. 
loving us, putting faith in us, and helping us to find proper balance. If you want to learn more about this, there's a book. And guess what it's called? Boundaries. It's called Boundaries. It's a book called Boundaries. It was written like 80 years ago. No, about 25 years ago, I think this book was written. And it is just as applicable today as it was back then. And if you want some copies of it, they have it at Half Price Books. Pick one up today, but it's awesome. They have a lot more topics than what we've covered. They have a lot of Bible uh, portions that will point you in how to, in a practical way, make boundaries in your life. You will not regret it. You will have a life that is more relaxed. Resentments will go down. Uh, expectations, unre- unfathomable expectations will go down. And you will have that peace knowing, you know what? I'm working for God. I'm doing what God wants me to do. And it's okay to say yes. It's okay to say no when I need to say yes and when I need to say no. So check that out. You can keep going on this. Make sure you come back next week because, again, the connected part, we're going to kind of tie that in to where we just came from. So, so, so glad to spend this time just briefly in God's Word with you.